This is a, a presentation I gave in America to uh, the front, but I'm going to depart from it a bit because uh, two things. One, it was a bit boring. The other thing was I found out some more information in between. As you probably know, I'm more aggressive in the history of the aircraft and their development than in the people side of things. And I've been uh, very interested in the development of the Curtis flying boats for quite a number of years now. And so I put this presentation together and after it had uh, gone through, etc., then I found a lot of lovely information about the background to it. I've managed to obtain the files that related to the Curtis to the Curtis port controversy with the commissions that port took illegally, which you might have read over the front. And I've also managed to dig out more information from the, after the war there was a commission of awards to inventors. If you invented a bomb or something, you went on this commission and said, this is what I did during the war, you know, I was patriotic, went to the government and I got nothing for it because everything was suppressed as far as patents went a certain extent during the war, and you then get a grant from the government. Port put up a claim, Curtis put up a claim, Norman Thompson put up a claim, and amongst all these people also Wanamaker had a claim in. These people and their names and the companies all intertwine in the story of the Curtis flying boats, and it's still quite confused, but I think I'm getting somewhere with some of it. Basically, the first story I was going to tell here was for the Americans. I call it Forgotten Americans. Because people say no American plane designed and built in America served the front in the First World War. They didn't serve the Western Front. But American flying boats were flying and fighting in the North Sea in the English Channel long before the Americans entered the war. Okay, mate. Glenn Curtis is one of our protagonists. He was an inventor, but he was not what you'd call... He was an inventor like Thomas Edison, that he would try something, didn't work, throw it away, try something else, didn't work, throw it away, oh, this works, go from here. But he wouldn't do it systematically. He would jump around, as you'll see when we get to the Curtis flying boats. John Cyril Port. Very interesting man, obviously a brave man. He left the Navy when he contacted tuberculosis in 1911, started flying, was involved in the British Deputies and Company, was also involved with the predecessor to the Norman Thompson Company. The Norman Thompson Company had the sole right to sell Curtis flying boats in Europe. Port arranged for the Admiralty to get Curtis flying boats. Port received commissions. He should have received them, one, because he was a serving naval officer, two, because Norman Thompson had the contract. So you can see how involved the story can get at the very best time. This one, please, Mark. When we were of clue with English Channel, as you know, the Daily Mail offered a prize for the first transatlantic flight. It could be anywhere in North America, anywhere on the English continent. It was hoped to try to promote real progress in aviation design. Glenn Curtis in 1913 took one of his 1913 model flying, flying boats, the Model F, to Europe, where it was successful, more successful than some of the European boats, but still had quite a lot of development lives still left in it. And it was here that Port and Curtis first came together. Port says that he so impressed Curtis with his flying and his understanding that he invited him to go back to America and help him. Port also claimed that he was the one who put forward the idea of a transatlantic flight before Curtis became interested. Next one, please, Mark. Port, Curtis, John Towers. Towers was a US naval officer serving who is going to be the co-pilot of the flight, the proposed flight, that is. The US Navy didn't like that. They couldn't stand the thought of their man being subservient to Port, who's going to be the prime pilot. So uh, it didn't come to a head because 
to the towers were set to Mexico with the Mexico expedition before the flight came off. There's so much in this early aviation history, the exact events will probably never be known. On the credit side, some sources say that D.D. Thomas, as the Englishman who designed the Curtis Jenny, designed the American flying boat. However, the design was well in hand before he left for the USA. It is felt that Port, Curtis, and possibly Thomas and others would all have input into the design. Given Port's later work on flying boats, it's considered that his exertion carries some weight. But since I wrote that, I found in the <coughs> it, um, submission to Commission for Inventions, Curtis actually came and put his case. And because he came and sat, he was cross-examined. He was cross-examined by a barrister. And the barrister asked him, you know, did you design the Curtis Flyman? Of course I designed the Curtis Flyman. Everything was done, it was mine. I was in charge. He said, well, I have letters here from Port to so and so and so saying, and he read that. And here's all these things that Port said that I suggested we did, and other things I suggested we didn't do. So Curtis then admitted, yes, Port had an input into it. But that's not to say that Curtis wasn't a designer. It's like Fokker and Sockwin. They were the men at the top. They said, this is what I want. You go and do this, you go and do that. Now, that doesn't mean they're not the designer. They knew what they wanted. You did your bit. You brought it together. The guy in charge, putting up the money, he's going to make the decision. So to say that Curtis wasn't a designer, or that Fokker wasn't a designer, is the wrong way of looking at things. Because these guys all worked, even in those days, on a collaborative basis. The Merida flying boat was the biggest flying boat in the world at the time. Nothing like it had ever been built before. So it was a gala event. It was so big that they couldn't erect it in the workshop. They had to erect it in the actual yards at the Hammersport for Curtis factory. It was a gala event for the launching and they, you see the American flag up there. I'm not sure what this one is, but I think it's one of those American societies that uh, were promoting, you know, preparedness before the war. There wasn't a British flag to be found, so Port stuck a British stamp on the side of the hull somewhere just to give it a, his input into it. Next, please, Mark. What they found was, with two engines, they didn't have enough power to get off the water and perform properly, so they added a third engine. The problem was with three engines, they couldn't carry enough fuel to make a flight, so they ended up taking the third engine off. Next one, please. See down here? The hull has been extended, and just by attaching very crudely sheets of timber to the bottom, there were quite a few um, examples of this done at this stage because why it could fly in its real configuration. It didn't have enough buoyancy, it didn't have enough uh, power, it couldn't take enough fuel. So this is what I mean by saying that Curtis was an innovator in that he worked, tried this, didn't work, okay, we put some hydrofoils on, try them, didn't work, try something else. And Paul was with him while this was going on. It did actually fly with the original configuration and there we can actually see it in flight. That's at the lakes at Hammersport in New York. Never in my days did I think we'd ever see a reproduction of the America boat, a flying one. The Curtis Museum at Hammersport has built this. It's as close to the original as they can get. As you can see, they've done a fantastic job on it. Seventy-four foot broad inches, thirty-eight feet. Biggest in the world at the time. Okay. When war broke out, Port immediately went back to England. He's accepted back into the Royal Navy and the Royal Naval Air Service. <coughs> Murray Soiter, who was in command of the, uh, the air department, where <coughs> excuse me, was it this, the actual um, testing and experimenting and all that was carried out was just called the Air Department of the Admiralty was very interested in this. Now, Sawyer knew what Port was doing because Port was writing him from America. The progress was very interested in his large flying boats. You've got to remember that um, 
except for the small boats like the FBA, and the, America, the uh, Germans were using float planes, the British were using float planes too. The float planes were not strong enough to stand up to North Sea conditions. So flying boats appeared to be a way to go. And when Port came back and said, OK, you've got these two flying boats, they're ready, they're for sale. So they bought them. They didn't perform well, but they're better than anything they ever had before, and they could see the promise of them. So they then said to the uh, first of the Admiralty, it was Winston Churchill at the time, these boats have a future. He was so impressed, and he said, we want 12. Port always wanted to build them in England. Port had been uh, instrumental in with Dimmerus and instrumental with Norman Thompson in building flying boats or building aircraft. He wanted to build them in England. He didn't want to have to drag them out from America. So they decided to build eight in England and all the four from the United States. The ones in England arrived in service many, many months after the fall from America. Curtis got them together and they were <coughs> sent to England and were they tried out. The Curtis engines were too heavy, didn't produce enough power, so they put Anthony radials in them. They weren't very successful and they've been referred to as comic boats, but they did perform some patrols and they did give a, a feeling of where they could go and they also gave the pilots experience in operating larger flying boats. The German embassy protested about the export of flying boats but the US Secretary of State declared that aeroplanes were not contraband of war. <coughs> they were known in England as Americas and this is where we get a bit confusing as you'll see as we go along. Back in America, while the English were building theirs, Curtis continued developing his flying boats. We don't know who his designers were. We have very little information, or I have found very little information. This particular version was apparently built for Denmark, but it never went there. You can see it bears the same relationship, which they all do with the big overhang of the top wing. And it's got a very large rudder on this particular one and a strange cockpit arrangement. With a lot of the Curtis boats, the only reason we know they exist is because there's a photograph of them. Very little information about some of them have survived. It's like, um, as you know, with all World War I stuff, you'd often have a file that thick of an experiment there, but one that was used in combat, you might be lucky you can find something like that. The Curtis H7, it was a large twin-engine flying boat. Apparently a couple of them were used by what was called uh, the Coastal Patrol, which was a volunteer organisation set up by one of these uh, you know, awareness societies. But I haven't been able to find very much about it at all. It was called the Super America in some uh, journals, so the terminology is very loose. This has been identified as the Curtis H8. It has also been identified as another one. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it is apparently in the H series, which appeared to have been only allocated to twin engine flying boats. When Curtis um, changed the H7 and turned it to HS1, which was the flying boat that the Americans used in France for the anti submarine patrols, because it had the single engine, it became HS. And that's why I think. H only refers to twin engine boats. This is the H8, as we know. This is the one that the English built. This is the boat that Port claims in his writings that he designed. Now, we know that Port Curtis was like that, and when America ended the war, the British and the Americans, in the Navy at least, were like that. Ideas were going backwards and forwards. The Americans were building British planes and the English were sending them information on what to do. And the Americans were developing their NC flying boats and they were getting information from Port, who was acknowledged as the expert on flying boats. The H8 had a <coughs> typical Curtis hull. 
it wasn't that successful. So what they did was, they actually modified it at Felixstowe. What was instrumental in that? They increased the buoyancy by building these up, changing the shape of the hull, and as far as I can work out, only one H8 was built as such. It came to England. The rest came and were known as large Americas, most documentation, but I'm sure they were to H12 standard. boats gave the English a weapon they didn't have before. They could operate in the North Sea. They were well armed, they had good endurance, and they were strong. This is one actually in, in France that's uh, <coughs> just a typical picture of the sort of conditions in Central, you can see it's got a little ship here, cranes and stuff in the background of the harbour, because they were so big, they required a lot of effort, they required a lot of manpower to operate. They were well armed for their day, they could carry bombs, Lewis guns attacked on wherever you could get it, one in the front nose cockpit, one there for the second pilot. They would very well protected from the rear. And this was one of the problems that they had with it. Next please, Mark. There you have some statistics for those who like statistics. The fact that the H1, H4, H8, improved H8, H12A, H12B, H12 convert, and later the H16 in Felixstowe series were all referred to as America boats, and some H-12s are fitted with F-2A hulls, makes the task of understanding what one is talking about at any particular time very difficult. The first large Americans arrived in early 1916. Now we had a weapon that could take the fight to the enemy. What the British were really concerned about was not the fact that their fleet was bigger than the German fleet, the Germans had Zeppelins. With the Zeppelins, they thought they could scout in advance of their smaller fleet and they would have the advantage on the British fleet. We know now that the Zeppelins were not very successful in their role in reconnaissance. But they were, early in the war, as far as the Navy went. This is not to do with their bombing raids on Great Britain. In fact, the bombing raids of Great Britain were virtually an aside from the main role of Zeppelin, which was to reconnoitre for the fleet. If one of these things was out 100 miles in front of the fleet or whatever, it could stay there for, for a week, go out, not a week, stay there for a day or two, go out in front of the ships, keep up with them if the weather was correct. Now, on the North Sea, the weather wasn't always amenable to, to their to sorting. But the legend grew up that the Zeppelins gave the Germans an advantage and they also helped the Germans in the Battle of Jutland. After the war, this was shown to be wrong, but by that time, of course, the, the British and the Americans and the French even had embarked on their own policies to develop rigid airship post war. Yeah? One quick question. Um, the bombs they had, were they for the use of the anti submarine? The well, the land. well, the flying boats. The flying boats. Yeah, the, the role as anti-submarine uh, anti. came in, but it came in <coughs> sort of secondary to the first one, which was anti-Zeppelin patrols. The British radar, 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 radio detection service was really great, and they knew when the Zeppelins were out. So what they could do was they could send a flying boat out. They knew where the Zeppelins were coming. And they knew the areas that they congregated in, so they could send a flying boat. And, and now they had a weapon that could actually reach the area where these operated. Because if you took um, float planes out, you had to haul them over the side, put them on the water, and if you were lucky, one of them might get off. And then they didn't have the, the height 
you get to the zeppelin, if you saw a zeppelin, you cause Katam, you got off the water, the zeppelin had gone. Yes, please, mate. The zeppelins were armed, as you can see there. There's a picture of the poor guy at the top, at least he's got a parachute. <laughs> 8666, it's going to be, it's one of the most famous of the H-12 boats and was slated to be preserved but like so much after the war it just got lost and it disappeared forever, unfortunately. We'll learn more about him later. Like I was saying before, the Zeppelin <coughs> was what they were after and May the 14th, 1970, L-22 was on patrol was intercepted by 8666. Christopher Galpin was the commander navigating, Bob Leakey was the pilot, and he had two others with him. As usual, it was a very bad day with heavy banks of clouds in the west. Taking advantage of the cloud cover, 8666 was flying in there when it sighted the silhouette of L-22 dead ahead and rising against the rising sun, about 10 or 15 miles away. Curtis dropped three bombs to lighten the load. Lee took the control wheel and increased speed. With two miles astern of the Zeppelin, he descended to 5,000 feet, increasing speed in the dive. He later recorded this was the only time he had a height advantage on the Zeppelin. Approaching within half a mile, L-22 finally seemed to see the flying boat as she put out her nose up and peaked increased speed. They dove at the boat, and in the front cockpit, Captain opened fire with incendiary ammunition. One it had twin guns, one failed, the other one fired a full magazine. 45 seconds from the first ignition, the envelope was burned off. 45 seconds, plunged into the sea, and that was that. The thing was, the Germans didn't know what had happened. The British did not make a fuss of it, they kept it quiet. A couple of days later, another Zeppelin was intercepted by a flying boat. And though this one got away, Commander thought it was a new port. He yeah. said it must have been a new port flown off a ship because of the, the fact that you had the big overhang of the wings. For him, he thought it was a new port. So at that stage, they did not know that the Zeppelins had been met with a weapon equivalent to himself. As the war progressed, the boats were used for any submarine patrols, they carried bombs uh, which weren't very effective in the main part. But the problem with when you're assessing anti submarine work is you're not looking at how many submarines you kill as much as how many ships get through. The fact that there was a, a, a seaplane there meant that the submarines could not operate on the surface. A submarine, of course, really likes to operate on the surface of the water. After a while, on the Zeppelin patrols because they now operate high at the height of the climbers and <coughs> the flying boats were too heavy, they couldn't get the altitude required and the time required once they sighted the Zeppelin. So they decided they'd send out land planes. So they sent out the Havilland Falls but accompanied by flying boats. If something went wrong, the crew at least had a chance of being picked up. This is September 5th, 1917. It took off from Great Dharma to search two Zeppelins. Leaky accompanied in 8666. Cavern 4 suffered, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the engine began giving trouble and the biplane could not reach its operating altitude. Both aircraft fired at L44. They sighted two Zeppelins, L44 and L46, about 30 miles off Fashion, about the same altitude, which is about 9,000 feet at that time. Despite the Zeppelin returning fire, didn't make the aircraft. However, German light cruiser anti aircraft fire damaged the radiator to the H4 and the hull of the flying boat. The Zeppelin tried to lead the British planes towards Walker, where, where German fighters would be able to intercept them. The Havilland Falls engine seized, so Leakey broke off his attack to accompany the land plane to service the sea. According to one source that said the DH-4 did not have flotation gear, but it was standard that they were fitted with flotation gear because they knew that they could likely come down and sea. 
When did the light in the rough sea leak in? You come up, that's his fuck over. Knew that the boat wouldn't be able to take off again. But however, he landed, he picked up the crew, and then he started to taxi towards the English shore until fuel ran out. The boat, having been hit by a shell splinter in the hull, was leaking badly. Extra petrol cans were hastily converted to bailing buckets. Heading for the English coast, the, the heavy following the sea constantly pushed the tail up in the air, and the bows under, allowing water to pour into the front of the cockpit. So he had to alter course to ease over the rollers. He was now steering away from the search area. Two of their four pigeons were released. As we all know, pigeons were very important in the First World War, on land and in the air. On the Wednesday evening, they ran out of fuel, so they began to drift. When the start, wind tip float was carried away. The men took a rest from bailing, getting up the opposite wind to hold the, the damage wing out of the water. The boat continued to drift. Another pigeon was released from the sixth, but was never seen again. On the afternoon of the same day, the last bird was released. This pigeon arrived at the station at 10.45 the next day. This proved that the crew was still alive, and rescue attempts were continued, but in the wrong area, because they had drifted the wrong way. They actually thought that if they came down, they would have been in their search area. The pigeon that had been released on the 5th had fought its way to shore, but then died. Its body was found by chance, and a message passed on. This message led to the search moving to the north. The message read, Government Print of the Pigeon Service, H12 8666, 10 to 5th, 4pm. We have landed to pick up the Howland 4 crew about 50 east by north of Java. See you up to get off. Will you please send for us as soon as possible? This boat is leaking. We are taxiing west by south south. South south? What's south south? Who's the, who's the, who's the, who's the, who's the Navy guy? What's west that? by south. West by south, isn't it? West by south. Yes, south. Okay. On Saturday the 8th, the old gunboat, Hull Salon, found the missing crew. service again and returned to Zeppelin hunting. The pigeon was stuffed and displayed at the Yarmouth Meth above the inscription, a very gallant gentleman. <laughs> Here they are picking up the crew and taking them back to the rescue ship. Next one. Robert Leakey, World First World War. Robert Leakey, Second World War. Awful lot of Canadians served in the Royal Naval Air Service, as you probably read. Um, Leakey was a Canadian and so was Garfield. Again. Okay. Back. Everyone. Yeah. Back at Phillipsville, Port was trying to, to improve the flying rate. Here's a, a, sh a list of hulls that he developed and tried, and again, you see the way it wasn't done in a modern scientific manner. They had an idea, they tried it out, didn't work, they tried something else. I didn't touch it. It was right. <laughs> and gradually, and gradually it worked all the way through up to the, the port one and then port two. And eventually to the Phoenix Stowe Fury, the huge triplane flying boat that would have been in service in 1919 for all the of course, he built the F2A, which was the premier flying boat of the First World War. There's a port one. Still got Curtis wings. Port only worked in the hull. As far as I can work out, there's no change at all to the, the wing structure through the various models he produced. And again, this was his his genius. Instead of building a boat with his hull. Four longerons, cross members, wire ties, and then add the hull to the outside. You can move them quick, you can move them easy, doesn't require a, a boat builder to do it. Like I said, F2A, 
Let's fly up over the wall. He's pretty loud. A big sucker for us, Dave. Some statistics. The thing with the F2A also was, with the H12, like I said, to the rear was virtually defenseless. The F2A, they had side guns that came out of mountains, and you could get between 12 feet under the tail. Those two guns. Next, please, mate. The F3 was a bigger F2. Apparently, it wasn't uh, as nice to fly and wasn't liked as much as the F2A, but they built an awful lot of them. It, it couldn't get the same altitude uh, used on submarine patrols. You could carry it with more bomb loads than the F2A. Lovely hole, it's a pity we haven't got one. There's the F3. Bigger was better. Now, <coughs> the Germans developed the float planes and they developed fighter float planes. So, with the Zeppelin more or less moving further and further out of the picture, except for the raids on London, you now had the English taking. They're flying boats and patrols further and further out in the North Sea and are hunting for submarines. So the Germans developed their aircraft to come and attack the flying boats. So you had this, this seesaw, the same as on the Western Front, where if somebody drew could use something, technology would improve this side, this side have to counter. Okay. Here we see a fleet so flying boat being attacked on the water by another. Then Friedrich Christensen, he claimed her for his fifth victory. On this occasion, she carried a mixed RAF and USN crew, which began in the fault in a fight with seven enemy seaplanes, five single seaters and two two seaters. After killing the stern gunner, Christensen threw power over the flying boat. His gunner sent the boat light. The boat then tried to light, but could not turn into wind as she was flying only ten feet above the water. Okay, Mark, I think this is a couple more there. See if it's shut up on the water there. When America entered the war, of course, the Allies wanted to use America to build weapons. Um, America had the technology, it had the manpower, it had the resources. When they set up in England with their um, actual stations, they were their stations around the coast, which were to take part in any submarine patrol. They elected to use Curtis H-16, which was the Felixstowe F-2A with Liberty Union. Virtually identical except for a few minor changes. What people don't know is that the, the fight against the U-boat, the submarine, had priority over all others as far as the Americans were concerned. They wanted to get their troops to France. They didn't want to lose any troop ships because the political repercussions could have been enormous. So the Navy had priority to Liberty Engines. The Navy had first priority to anything that would affect the submarines. And that's why you had the Northern Bombing Group formed by the Navy, flown by the Marines in France, much to the disgust of the Army, because bombing should have been left to the army, but the Navy said, we're bombing the submarine pins. That's the Navy job. The Navy has a job of taking the submarines. So you can see how all these different things interwind into the story of World War I, that you, you start on one track, think you're going down there, and there's a lovely little bar we have there. When I find myself over here and I forgot what I'm going to do it over here, you know what I mean? It's, I find it quite fascinating. It? It's um, when you're going through files and things, and all of a sudden you find a little nugget of gold, you know, you think, my God, you know, that's something that I could have used way back then, if only I knew it at the time. Or you publish something and somebody comes forward and says, You're wrong, man, because I've got to stop it. It's just completely different. But that, that's what, what the whole talk's about, you know. It's um, getting the story out there, trying to make it understood by other people, and, and sharing it, sharing the knowledge and sharing it, the data. I think so, anyway. The pretty taxi built. Sorry, Bill bought H-16s off the Americans, but as far as I know, they were just coming to serve before the war ended. That's an American H-16 
in service in England at Killingham. They, you probably saw that article we did for Cross and Cockade about uh, Killingham Base. They flew quite a number of um, anti submarine patrols. They attacked submarines. Um, they were credited with submarines, but I don't think one's ever been confirmed post-war as being right. After the war, H-16 is one of the uh, <coughs> main flying boats. They used them quite a bit in developing their, their, uh, their, their actual um, tactics of what they were going to do, how they're going to use flying boats. Um, they had squadrons of flying boats which would then leave and go down to South America or Cuba, Cuba is South America, go, go through there, show the flag, and the idea was that they could take the flying boat, go somewhere, have a ship there, operate in there, and develop this so they could operate anywhere in the world. Like the aircraft carrier today, but the aircraft carrier, you've got to remember, just coming into being at the end of the First World War. The last of wartime boats was the F-5, served the RAF post-war, and also you see it's bigger again. Every time it's a little bit bigger. It might only be a couple of feet, but they go just keep growing and growing. In America it was the F5L. What the Americans did was they kept the actual dimensions, everything was the same as the Felicito boat, but under the skin they completely redesigned it for American methods and American materials. This little guy down here, or big guy down here, you see, is the only Felixto boat I know of that's in existence today. But it is the F5L, it's the American version, and it's at the Smithsonian Institute. It was built like that, with half exposed and half covered. And originally it had the wings and everything, but over the years they've been lost and only the whole remains. The Felixto boats were as colourful boats as the war, I reckon, as you can see there. Plenty of lovely colour schemes for you modellers. One quick question. Um, the upper wing. Yep. Mr. Bob, those struts of those... Like, Anti-skid fins. They bring just drag those to the top? Or They're called anti-skid fins because when you turn them back, they're supposed to, to hold you in the back rather than sliding out of the bank. Whether they worked effectively or not, I don't know. But you'll see it on a lot of world by any craft like Curtis, yeah, Jenny, right, etc. Okay. Another lovely one. That was uh, Landon Bridgman, I think, painted that. So he was actually there at the time, so that's probably an authentic colour scheme. Okay. The triplane Fury was Port's last design. It was really huge, and like I said, if 1919 had, had carried on with the war, then you would have seen those go to service. One was built, and it was going on a flight to Egypt in one of his. Flights after the war to establish records, etc. It crashed on takeoff, killing some of the crew. As a result, the second one, which was under construction, construction was stopped and none more were built. And as Port um, had left the Navy then and gone into uh, private practice, he was going to work for, uh, so I can't think of the name of the company, but virtually he had a civilian design of this one ready to go when he died and when he went to the uh, the company lost at the interest and it, it just went out of existence. Okay. And that's unfortunately the end of the Felix Day Fury. But these are the two best contemporary books on flying boat operations in the First World War. This is more written like a boy's own story. It, it's really good. This one is more historical and you obviously had access to official records when you wrote it. Because some of the things he's got in there I found in files that you know, weren't released until 1960 and it was published between the wars. I expect in the next 10 years, with the anniversaries coming up, a lot of these things will come up again. They well worth getting into those books. These are two uh, con uh, contemporary with us books about um, <coughs> flying boats. Sorry about that. This was published by the Imperial War Museum. 
and it carries right through the war and post-war, just a little paperback. Again, a very good book. If you see, or you're be really interested, buy the online version. I bought the hardcover and I, I'm not going to tell my wife how much it costs because she'll kill me. <laughs> and that's, gentlemen, it is my presentation. Is there any questions or details? I just a, a small comment, I don't know if everyone realises, but in developing his engine, Curtis actually wrapped a motorcycle chassis for a wheel at the front of the front of wheel back, and prior to the first world war, he got the world motorcycle and speed record of 136 miles an hour. He, like I said, he looked like Edison, he was an innovative guy and he knew what to do. Apparently though, um, the company had problems about 1917, and there was a big um, change in administration, etc. I think he's more or less withdrew from it then, and I think he went to South America to grow cattle. But <laughs> what happened then is sort of like what happened with Curtis Wright later on. I mean, Curtis Wright was such a fantastic company during the pre Second World War years, then it sort of hit the P40, and then just fell out. It's, um, it's quite fascinating with the history of aviation companies. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. In 1935, um, Robert Leckie was the wing commander appointed to Hendon. And his son, Robert Leckie, went to my school. And uh, thereafter, they, when their boy had a birthday, the uh, accommodation on Aerodrome Road uh, was used at their place for a party. And we were all invited to, to go and fire guns and scramble all over uh, the uh, Avro tutors and things like that. And I, I corresponded with, with the father, uh, Robert Lecky, uh, oh, in the, about the 1970s, and I got a nice reply. But um, he was, uh, I've never seen those two photos that you presented there, namely the one uh, standing at full, full height in uh, World War I, or the World War II uh, when he became a, an air commodore or something. Yeah, I've never seen that. Yeah. Never seen that. Yeah, that's the whole thing too, you know, these guys from the First World War were still serving a lot of them in the Second World War, so, you know, yeah. I'm sure even some of the summer ring commander might be the same as well. He was, um, his son, Robin, Robin, went in the Navy. Like when I last heard of him, he was, he was in the RCN. But uh, when he was a schoolboy, when he came to the school, the, uh, the headmaster, who was not very bright, um, said, you know, got this poor new boy in front of the whole school, asked him to say something in French, because he imagined that every Canadian spoke two languages, at least. And uh, of course, embarrassed the poor kid very much, but uh, that was typical of the headmaster. But, uh, that's the, the uh, extent of leggies that I knew. Very nice people. R rather small, actually. If you could compete small, makes you yeah. more, more warm enough than a flying boat. He, 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 no trouble about uh, fitting in a DH4, I think. Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing with the big flying boats, mate. It, it's not as glamorous as the Western Front because most of the guys got in, wrapped themselves up, took off, flew in terrible weather. Bumped around, never saw a bloody thing, came back, landed, and went off, put the reports in, and that was it. Because you can read the reports over and over again, they fly up, hours at a time, terrible weather, see nothing. That's it. Yes? Any statistics available for kills? Uh, yes. Um, that last book I said, the very expensive one. By, uh, it has details in there. I've got something here if I can find it for you. Oh, 
I always thought that there was only one really confirmed flying boat, or excuse me, aeroplane, killer of submarine, that was the, uh, the Australian Gerrans on the French submarine, but um, I knew that the Blackburn kangaroo was instrumental in another attack, but the actual killing was done by the destroyer, but the kangaroo brought to the area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Yo says the H-12 is credited with the only confirmed unaccompanied sinking of a U-boat by a British aircraft. He says that H-12 8695 from Dunkirk sunk UB-32 in 1917 September. Um, there's a number of works. There's aircraft versus submarine by Alfred Price. It's both World Wars, but it, it's a good one. Thank you.